Hi everyone, welcome to Anthropology Straight Up. This is our second talk that we're doing of our uh, events. We will be doing these probably every two months. Uh, my name is Kohanya Graf, I'm a doctor of anthropology, and I founded a nonprofit called LS Network, which stands for Broadening of Anthropology Spectrum. And my goal at the time of doing this was to um, make anthropology more accessible and entertaining for the mainstream, because people come up to me all the time and, can you go closer? Someone in the back asked. Oh, oh good. That was, a, that, was a, that was a good thing. Um, and uh, BOA stands for Broadening the Anthropology Spectrum. It also is after the founding father of American anthropology, Franz Bowens. And um, so our goal in being a nonprofit is to provide a direct link to the public to enter the world of anthropology in an entertaining and accessible way. Um, and what we do, we're actually recording this talk now so that we'll be posting least the talk on our website, but we also have other videos and fun science videos that you can watch as well. So we're an education forum. Um, so the Anthropology Straight Up Talk series are designed to give speakers a place to showcase, promote, and, and enlighten viewers into the world of anthropology. And every event we'll, we'll be doing a different theme. So tonight we're talking about celebrating age and the cross-cultural perspectives on that. September 8th will be our next one, I was September 28th will be our next one we'll be doing at the University Club. And our theme will be on uh, shamans, psychics, and mediums. And, and, our, and uh, it'll be including uh, a talk by our local psychic medium, Tony Morris, who's over there. You can see what in here. We're going to be talking. So, and, and, and I've had two readings from him, and he's really good. So. Um, and um, so you can, uh, by joining our email list, you can also follow us at Bellas Network and our Facebook page uh, for upcoming anthropology news, events, and videos. So check out the website, bellasnetwork.com. And um, so with tonight's theme on celebrating age, uh, it is a subfield in anthropology. Uh, for example, there are studies of successful aging, adaptation um, to aging, cross-cultural comparisons of aging, and also the number of people age 65 and older um, is increasing dramatically in both developed and under as developing worlds. Uh, so anthropologists are looking at cultures and biology and behavior and environment and how they vary tremendously across uh, older populations. Um, and in our society, there is a cultural stigma uh, with older adults encountering ageism in various forms on a regular basis. And I, after meeting two uh, women speakers tonight, they've changed my perspective on that, and, and I'm sure they will change yours on that as well. And they've really, truly embraced aging. And I'm uh, now, my my world view on, on aging is I can't, I'm, I'm looking forward to each year now. And uh, so first, I'm going to introduce um, Julie Tumamayat Stensley. She is a Chumash Native American elder and she's chair of the Barbaranyo Venturanyo Mission Band of Indians. And she, Julie carries the traditions and histories and songs of the Chumash cultures based on her family's native roots um, and experiences in Ojai. She consults museums, uh, anthropologists including myself. She was my prime consultant for my dissertation. And uh, she probably knows more about anthropology than I do. And she advocates for the protection of Native American archeological sites and she serves on the state's uh, Native American Heritage Commission. Uh, so please welcome her she shares her insights into Native American perspectives on honoring age. I guess she has to call me to work to see her. I never see her. <laughs> but anyway, before we start, I really want to say a prayer for Creator to help guide this weather, call in the cloud people, put out our fire, and blessings to, and prayers to all those living beings who lost their life in this fire, all the rooted people and the four-legged and winged people in this devastating fire. This is this time of year, and so we ask Creator, we say our prayers, put them out there to stop this, bring it to a close. For all the firefighters that are rescuing people and, and, and risking their lives in this, in this devastation that happens as we see it year after year. 
So when we, as, as Native peoples, come into this place, we always, I always ask people, don't be dissing the rain. And it doesn't matter if you have an event, just let it clean it off and get everything ready for you. Uh, it's so important, I was in Zuni one year, and my son, who's autistic, didn't like the rain on him. He doesn't like being wet. And the boy said, oh, no, don't get your umbrella. We don't want to diss the rain. I went, ooh, I don't want to diss the rain either. And he says, if you get wet, we get wet. Because they don't irrigate. In traditional places of the Pueblos, they don't irrigate. They don't have running water out in their fields. They pray. They pray the rain in. So we did a ceremony on Sunday, full moon ceremony. And I prayed for that. I prayed for that to the clouds to come in. The little girl was there. Oh, I saw the puffy clouds. I said, yes, let's sing them in. So we sang in the puffy clouds, and the, our weather did change. The humidity shifted, the weather cooled down. So we always have to remember to think outside ourselves, to not worry about what we're doing. Because, you know, when, we, when, when you um, have negative energy and put that out there, they're listening. They're listening. Oh, okay, fine. If you don't want us to rain, we'll go away. We'll go do it somewhere else. So, no, we want it here. We want to encourage that and bring that here. Uh, because we, both of us, even in Ohio where I live, we're suffering. And, um, you know, as, as I grew up, somebody asked me, oh, so, so tell me about yourself. And I said, well, I was a poor Indian growing up in the river in Miner's Oaks. <laughs> and we were. There were seven of us. Uh, my, I'm the youngest of seven. <coughs> and although we knew we were Native, we knew we were Chumash, our, our, um, our last name gave everybody to Mamayat, an orphan, one who was raised by his grandparents and learned to carry things on his back, my great-grandfather, Juan de Jesus who was born in 1811, right in the middle of mission system. After everybody was being brought into the, into the mission systems, out of villages, and put of subservience and conversion into Catholicism. He, he came out of that on the other side. His parents died when he was a young boy, a year and a half after each other. And so the people in Mitzkanakan, which is the village, the jaw of the coyote, there at the mission, San Buenaventura, they gave him that name to Mamayat. So it means, again, an orphan, one who was raised by his grandparents and learned to carry things on his back. And so that last part of that name is where I have accelerated in my purpose here, is that advocacy of social justice, environmental justice, of carrying the weight of literally the Chumash people in my family, my extended family, my tribal group, and speaking and representing, and the social, uh, environmental justice for all living beings in our, in our tradition. So as we come upon age, we learn, and, and all traditional, even in today, you have to think you know, that there are still people living in their indigenous cultures, and they are still living off the resources that are there, and they've adapted over thousands of years. Native peoples in here, over 13,000 years, they've adapted to their environment. Um, when we learn about the abundance of what is here in our land, we should never have to plant another English rose. We should get rid of the ivy. <laughs> I know there's a purpose for ivy somewhere in England, or, but I, I, I've always wanted to research it because I'm sure every plant has a purpose. It's just not here. <laughs> and the eucalyptus, take it back to Australia, it's soaking up all our water. Um, you know, so people come in and they conquer. And they not only conquer people, they conquer land. Um, as I said, growing up in that, in that little tiny town in the Ojai Valley, Miner's Oaks, we knew we were native. But what we sounded like, what, how we spoke, we didn't know these things. My father, during that mission period, he was born in 1919. My mother is from Mexico, Guanajuato, Mexico. And he was working at the Canet Ranch where they met. So he became an elder only within 10 years of, in, of his life. He was almost full blood. His mother was half, her father was from Sonora, Mexico. He became a beautiful storyteller. And we always grew up around music. So it was always dancing and singing and he'd always buy me records at payday. And I had my little record player. And being the youngest, I wasn't until probably 10 years after he passed in 1992, uh, an elder, Mela Whitefeather, she was a Lakota elder, she looked at me, she had this cute little voice. She called everybody baby girl. She said, oh, baby girl, your dirt daddy's so proud of you. And I said, oh, I know Mela. She goes, no, he really is, he knew you were the one. I said, really? Because he never really spoke. He supported everything I did. When I started getting involved in politics, he would support me. He wasn't raised that way. He voted, but he kept his opinions to himself. He never taught us about those things. So. 
growing up, I, I really was a lot alone being the youngest of seven. And I watched other people, I observed other people, and that really helped me. It helped me to go, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I'm not doing that. You know, so um, that led me to a place where being outdoors, my safe place, and as an elder, I consult with people and counsel people to find your safe place. Where is that? Is it outdoors? Is it in the mountains? Is it, is it you know, in, in the comfort of a, a quiet enclosed room where you really, some people really need to feel safe. Others are beautiful outdoors. I was picking up ladybugs and sow bugs and collecting pollywogs. That was my safe place out in the, out in the fields in the Ojai Valley and in Myers Oaks with no lights. It was actually a place where our great-great-grandmother, Alula Mewe, grew up. Alula Mewe meaning one who drags her feet. <laughs> I gave that name to my oldest daughter who can turn a 20-minute job into an hour. <laughs> so being an elder and, and looking at age and coming up into this place where I never saw myself doing this kind of work, I really did not know where I was going growing up. Sometimes we know. And sometimes there are elders and visionaries in, in the culture who see someone who specializes in certain things. And they go, ah, that's going to be the basket weaver, the quiet one. Oh, that's going to be the, the good hunter because he's, he's good at the games that you played when you were young. So, you know, there's, there's people always watching you in the village. And, and as you go and get in trouble, you know, they thought, oh, that's the one who can figure it out. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a wolf would take a, a group of young boys and put them in a place, build a village. I go, what? Ooh, just go, go, go get your village. And he would watch to see who was telling every managing, the project manager, <laughs> who, was, who was delegating work. You know, so there are different ways of, of having people know their service, what is, what is important to them. Today's society, everybody says the kids of millenniums, you can be anything and everything you want. No, you can't. It's too frustrating, it's too disappointing. We all have a purpose in our world of what we need to be and how we need to act in the world. So we use stories as well to, to learn how to, how to behave in this world. We had no horses, we had no transportation. So as people moved from village to vi village, season to season, moving like in, in our area of Matilha, they'd go along the river where there's water. They would knew what kind of seeds to collect. But on their journeys of walking and working with their hands and, and using their teeth for, for plant material and, and stretching sinew, you can tell how old a person was by the lack of dentin in their teeth. And I've, I've dealt, part of my service besides being a tribal chair and, and a, counsel, a, counsel, a counselor and just a listener, is uh, taking care of my dead, taking care of my relatives that have been desecrated. And, and exchanging skulls as people collect them and put them on their mantles. They go, oh, one, one came from Santa Barbara and showed up in Ojai in a box. Indian skull. I said, why is it here at the thrift store? Oh, wow. <laughs> oh well, I used to travel from Santa Barbara to Ojai when these people come. Well, so I do, a, that's a lot of the work that I do is, is really intuitive and really, you know, of service to take care of my elders. Last year it was eight individuals from Malibu to Cuyama in different situations of desecration. Um, but getting back to the purpose of an elder is that, it is exactly that. When I became an elder was when my father passed in 1992. He had had about 10 years when he retired from Shell Oil and he had time on his hands. And the two guys, Michael Ward and Clarence Sterling, Michael Ward is a professor of anthropology, Clarence now is in spirit world, but he uh, loved music and he loved the Chumash music. So they saw my daddy hanging out at Bill Baker's having coffee and said, hey, Vince, we're over here at the art center. We're going to do a winter solstice ceremony. You want to come with us? Oh, yeah, sure. And that started the Painted Cave Choir, <laughs> where they went everywhere performing and, and singing and making presentations from all over Santa Barbara, the Natural History Museum, into Ojai, to the Baha'is, the Day of Peace at the Hollywood Bowl. They went everywhere. So I joined him a little bit late in, his, in that journey, and we would do ceremonies together, we would do presentations together. We would sing our coyote song at Malibu Creek State Park for the docents, and after we howled, the coyotes howled back. <laughs> they were, well, you know, coyote has such a big ego. So he's like, oh, tell me more. Oh, oh my eyes. You know, so it, part, part of all that journey, when he passed, and he passed very suddenly, um, August 19th, 1992, 
I called upon the elders, uh, our great friend Anthony Romero from San Inez. We had done many programs with he and his family. So I asked Tony to come and do ceremony, uh, both my mother and father at the Ojai Cemetery. So it was at that time that we, um, I mean, it was so sudden, we had no really time to think. But Tony, he came over to everybody and he said, I have something for somebody, but they don't know it yet. Where the responsibility goes to the eldest male in the tribe, we, I see somebody here who is already on that path. And with that, he handed me his ceremonial pipe. And it was at that moment, I used the S word. <laughs> like, tag, you're it. <laughs> and, and so having that, people forget, you know, even, and I think for women, and in, in, in who take on the responsibility of leadership, of, of uh, advocacy for whoever, for you know what they're interested in. We always have one, you know, um, not just somebody who's going to be always at you, just always you know putting you down or not supporting you, and that usually comes in the form of men. Because women shouldn't be doing that. Women should be in the home. Women should be raising the kids. But in our society, women always played that role of, an, um, of a chief. In Ventura County, our, it's like 1869, our last wot, which is our word for chief, was Pomposa. And she, this, this position was given to her in the little township of Satakoy. And she had a festival there where people came from all over the place. And in our tradition, um, now we don't have much recorded, it's in the signal if you want to read it, in the library at the Venture Museum. We have this little wild cherry that grows. It's not much meaty, but inside the pit, the pit has cyanide in it. And you could still eat this stuff if you leach out the cyanide. But in this festival that Pomposa put together, there was one ball of isle, Spanish word for isle, a little tray of all these little isle balls. And in one of the balls, one had enough cyanide to kill you. And people partook from this tray freely during this festival. That's where the story ends. We don't know if anybody actually ingested it. But it was so our, our, our culture is very um, not unique, it's just very intricate. Uh, being an elder, there was an ant doctor. Women could be doctors, they could be political leaders, they can have own property or marry or not marry if they wish to. And, and as, as we grow into that elder stage, even for men, the Yanunali ruled through three villages out here. Uh, our, our information that came from Fernando Labrado, he lived till he was about a hundred and, I think they said a hundred and five. My great grandfather, Juan de Jesus Tumamaya, lived to a hundred and one. But that was post-mission. Pre-mission, the people, mm, old age was at about 60, 70, because of the strain and the work and walking everywhere. And they did. They moved seasonally. But, you know, the, the one of the main, um, besides the diseases, when Spanish came here, prior to that, when people use their teeth and they grind their acorns, and the, pounded their acorns in the bowls, pieces of rock would be in your, in your food, get lodged in the teeth, and we just didn't have the medicines to, to cure the infections. So that was one of the highest rates of death for the native peoples were those uh, tooth decay. Um, but other than that, you know, there were medicines and plants. Uh, deer blood, erythromycin is in deer blood. It, it helped wounds and acted as a antibiotic. Uh, we had echinacea, we had uh, yerba santa, uh, which was a blood purifier. We had yerba mansa. Uh, that, all these plants are still growing. Uh, the yerba mansa was also a blood purifier. So these people knew, even acorns. Acorns, uh, believe it or not, is an antioxidant. Um, it, it was used in ancient Egypt as massage oil. It was used in Japan where they still make acorn noodles and they keep the tannin in there to rid the body of oxides and inflammation. So we learn all these things later. The, um, the chia seed also has uh, omega-3. And so, you know, learning where you're here now in, in L.A., Tonga people, for the people down south, have uh, traditional mes medicines. So we can still live this way, and we can still be healthy living this native diet. Now, some of you, you know, come from areas where your blood's different. So I'm an O, so I can do that paleo thing. And, but you can do paleo in your own place. 
and and you and we have all the foods. I think the one thing about aging, whether you're native or not, you're tribal, is that we shouldn't be eating certain foods around the year when they're not available. Naturally, we should be eaten seasonally. Okay, because it's very important. It's very important to keep yourself healthy. Elders always told you what to do. Uh, if you had intestinal troubles, maybe you ate some fish from the ocean that had uh, worms in it, for instance. You would go to the ant doctor. Now the ant doctor is usually a woman, an elder woman, and she was in her hut. And so you had this horrible, horrible digestive problem. You would go into her hut, and she would sit you down, and she would have the red harvester ants. And she would roll these live red ants into downy the feathers, uh, the down feathers of the eagle, and these little tiny balls of little ants. And then she would say, say, ah, 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 and she would stuff one of these little furry ant balls down your gullet. And that cure would last up for three days, depending on how ill you were. And you would swallow these little ant balls. As, as the treatment went further, she would come, I don't know what she did, you know, you're all quiet and you're meditating and you're like ugh, swallowing these ant balls. She would like ugh, make scare you and that would break the ants out of their little bags and the, the poison or whatever it was in the ants would eat and, and break apart everything that was inside you, the, 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 I don't know, plaque or, you know, the digestive stuff, whatever you ate, the poisons, and that was a cure, believe it or not. So I tell kids, if you're not good, I'm going to send you to the ant doctor. I asked an elder one time in Hopi, where the mesas are really high, is there a way to keep the babies from the edge of the cliff of the mesa? Oh, yeah. There's a monster that hides right there. And we tell the grannies, tell the story. They tell us, that's our, pro that's our, our well, I don't have grandchildren, I don't have will, but I'll adopt some. But that's the purpose, too, is to share these stories, keep the traditions going, keep the, the, our stories, everybody's stories, these traditional stories are teachings, where we call them myth and lore. If you listen to them long enough, they become true. So as we, as we tell these stories about the monster on the other side of the cliff, a child, until they get to know better that they don't believe in that old-fashioned stuff, <laughs> will not go to the edge of that cliff where a 60 mile an hour wind could blow that child off because they don't want to get eaten by that monster. <laughs> so as we move into this place of learning indigenous traditions that everybody has and, and, and the qualities of living in a traditional landscape where you're not uh, destroying the natural landscape, that you're actually promoting native peoples new not to gather everything of everything. You left something you offered, and you said your prayers to every single thing in the Harvest Festival, which happened in uh, late August. And, um, and we still practice those things. We still do uh, equinoxes, ceremonials. We do the Carpinteria Bluffs, our 22nd year. Next year will come up when we do Spring Equinox Sunrise Ceremony, where everybody's invited to come. And we do Winter Solstice. We do Summer Solstice. Uh, although I missed it by a month, and that's why we did the ceremony in July, because <laughs> I was so busy. Part of my work as an elder is consulting. Not only do I have a tribal group, but I have to work with all agencies throughout Ventura County and L.A. to protect our cultural resources. That when development happens, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not tired of taking care of my elders and my relatives that are being desecrated, but I am tired of the frivolousness of what people want in this world and, and, and how they are willing to pay anything to not have to make a permit to or mitigate uh, our resources, our natural resources, our cultural resources, and so I'm a big advocate. And it's my duty as a tribal elder and tribal leader to um, consult with um, county planning departments, uh, city commission, planning commissioners, and city councils, so lucky me. I have to keep repeating myself about Chumash 101A. <laughs> and I, I say A is for archaeology, <laughs> C is for cultural resources, and P is for protection. So I, I sing this song for many, many years, and I'll continue to sing it until, until people understand that when you desecrate, your soul suffers. And where people have done that, and I've had to, had to do healing, and I've had to consult and collect, from people who have done that, um, they get well. 
They get well afterwards. And, um, and places aren't haunted. It's just that we have this self-fulfilled prophecy that we make ourselves ill because of guilt. So those are kind of the things that an elder does also in our world. And so we do this. And we take care of ourselves, too. Um, I, have a, I have to plan my three-day retreat at Casa de Maria. And I said it was going to be a silent retreat, which made my children laugh at me. <laughs> I said, I could do it. <laughs> I had to like, put a little sign in behind in silence. <laughs> but tonight, I thank you so much for listening to me. And I hope to see you again. We say kiwanan. In our culture, it means goodbye for now. Thank you. second time she got cancer, the first thing that she did was enter a writing, take a writing class. Or that would be the last thing I would think of. I would just be like, you know, party time, it's, it's, it's over. But she took a writing class, started a blog uh, called Aging in High Heels, uh, now has a tremendous following from Aging in High Heels. Since then she has done three book deals at TEDx, speak, uh, TEDx Talk, and uh, she's also an aging advocate for the Think Tank uh, Global Health Span. Um, uh, uh, Policy Institute, Washington, D.C., and she speaks regularly about the beauty of aging. So please welcome Beverly Hyman. Hi, everyone. Hello. So happy to have you all here. I'm going to try and take this out. What the heck do I do? I got it. I got it. So, First of all, Julie, where are you, Julie? That was such a great inspirational speech. Your culture can teach our culture so many things about how you treat elders, how you become elders, and I'm hoping I see just a crack in our culture that's beginning to lean your way, where we're beginning to look at our elders, our older people, with respect and admiration. And I can see that happening. So you're such an inspiration, and it's going to be really hard to follow you. No, no. <laughs> anyway, thank you. And thank you, Kohanya. This is the greatest idea, anthropology straight up. Thanks. What a great idea. I don't know about you, but I never saw an anthropology professor look like that. <laughs> I know that's probably very 50s of me, but meanwhile, it's pretty inspirational that she's beautiful and brainy. And I think this is such a good idea to make anthropology accessible to everyone. And I'm so honored to be part of your first lecture series. And I wish you such good luck. I know you'll have it. To tell you how I got so interested in aging, I really have to go back and tell the backstory. My first cancer diagnosis, that's always a, a fun line my first cancer diagnosis, was an easy one. They said, this is easy to cure. This is um, nothing. This is uteral stromal, ut uteral lining cancer. Hysterectomy, over and out. Keep taking your hormones, see no reason not to, and just go about and live your life, which I did. And then, 12 years later, my cancer came roaring back. When the doctors from the first cancer had told me that my cells were self-contained, quote, those self-contained cells came roaring back into my abdomen, thus creating eight large tumors in my abdomen. Oh my 
And after many tests, when the doctor said, after the last biopsy, it's utero stromal sarcoma, fourth stage, metastasized, inoperable, all those terrible words, but the last four words were the worst, you have two months to live. Well, you have several choices there. The first thing I said was, and I don't know how I knew to say it, is I need more opinions. I wanted, I wanted a lifestyle that would give me quality of life. I had brand new grandsons, twin grandsons that were a year old. I had a four-year-old granddaughter and a husband that I'd only been married to 15 years. I wanted quality of life with all of them. They wanted to give me four kinds of chemotherapy, 24 hours a day into the sight, three weeks at a time. I'd get very ill, go all the way down. When that was over, they'd resection my stomach. I'd get very ill, long recovery. When that was through, they'd give me the chemotherapy again. All of this with no promises at the end. That didn't sound like a fun two years to me. And all this time, there were no promises because meanwhile they had told me I had two months to live. So I kept going. I kept going and I got other opinions. And I got three doctors, or two doctors that then said, same thing as the first doctor. Two months to live. Time is of the essence. If you don't do it now, you're losing your window of opportunity. Luckily, I had doctors four and five lined up, or rather my team did. And doctors four and five came up with an experimental treatment that saved my life. Doctor four, Dr. Charles Forsher from Cedar sinai was the first doctor to go back and look at those contained cells and found out that those had traveled into my abdomen. He said, go to Dr. Five, Dr. Frederick Eilber at UCLA, we're gonna to work together on this, and then we'll let you know what treatment we're gonna come up with. And so I did. And the doctor there said to me when I said, but wait, it's metastasized, it's all over. How are you gonna do this? He said, now you wrap your brain around this. If this works, this is gonna to get to your cancer wherever it is. I was so lucky to be born in this era. I had lost my grandmother, my mother, and my two sisters to cancer. And here I was in this era where I was getting opportunities that they never had. Knowledge was being shared across the world that never happened before. They had all kinds of new experimental treatments that I had the privilege of knowing about. How lucky was I? So I stand on the shoulders of the women in my family who never got to be past 63. This Sunday, I'm lucky enough to turn 83. And the even better news, thank you, is that I'm living 15 years with my cancer. I live side by side with my tumors. They don't bother me and I don't bother them. We go about our business. And what cancer has done for me is give me a passion, a great passion to get to as many people as I can with any disease and tell them, you can do this. Whatever you have, you have to be your own advocate. You have to be co-captain with your doctor. He has hundreds of patients. You only have one. You have to tell him how your body feels. He brings the knowledge of science to you. You bring the knowledge of your body to him. Well, what does that have to do with aging, you're thinking? Well, as I was, I, I was lucky enough to write my first book. I went to a writing class right away. And I thought I was just going to write things for my kids. But the Santa Barbara Cancer Center published this book called I Can Do This. And I gave it to people who were diagnosed. And then I wrote another book with my granddaughter uh, explaining cancer to children called Nana What's Cancer. But the most important thing that happened to me is I was connecting with people who were in that 
befuddled stage of where shall I turn, what shall I do, where should I go, and I could help, and that made me feel wonderful. And while I was recuperating and still living with my cancer, I decided that I needed to bring my best self to the table, meaning I needed to exercise, I needed to eat properly, I needed to have goals, I needed to be joyous, I needed to be grateful. And I worked on all of those things. I did visualization, I did acupuncture, I did Pilates. I did everything you can imagine to do my part to help the doctor. Well, what this has to do with aging is that as I was moving along into my 70s, I saw, wait a minute, I still feel great. I'm 75, I'm 77, I'm 78 turned 80, and I was still feeling good, and I realized that what I needed to do for aging was, was the same thing I had done for cancer, or that you do for any disease, because cancer is a, a, a disease, aging is a disease just like cancer is. So we need to help it as much as we can and bring our best selves to the table here again. And so I was invited to speak at Washington, which was such a thrill. And I spoke at the Capitol building um, at a briefing. And I heard how everybody there talks about aging. Aging is such a hot topic there. Because, because we're living longer and stronger, my generation, our generation, those of you who are in your 70s, 80s, and 90s, we're living longer and stronger because we're living in a health span rather than a lifespan. And the longest we can live, the, the more we can live in this health span, we're going to keep living a long time feeling great. And it's not only a benefit to us, it's a benefit to the government because that's putting trillions back into the government. Into the, we're putting trillions back into the government because age-related diseases cost money diabetes, cancer, heart disease, um, arthritis. If we can push those back by 10 or 15 years, which we've managed to do because of all the knowledge we have about health now, if we can do that, we're helping put money back into the government. So here we are, this generation of 70, 80, and 90 years old, and the doctors are learning from us. They've never seen people like us before. Yeah. When, I, <laughs> when I go talk at senior citizen homes, I don't see little old people. I see interested, vital people. They're going to classes, they're going to lectures, they're, they're getting married. There was a couple, 89 years old, holding hands. I said, what's going on with you guys? They said, we just got married. They were 89, both of them. I don't think she was pregnant, but I'm not sure. <laughs> You know, this generation, you don't know. <laughs> but they're, they're wanting to learn, and they're doing fabulous things, men and women. Pat Mitchell, the head of TED Women, who is such a wonderful speaker and thinker, said, watch out for the women in their 70s and 80s, because they've got nothing to lose. Right? We can say whatever we want. What's going to happen? And we've got this wisdom that we've that we've garnered as we've aged, which is amazing. And we can hand it down to those coming up behind us. So like in Julie's culture, we're beginning to learn to respect those of us that are up here in our aging so that we can bring those up behind us and teach them, don't be afraid of aging. The only thing you lose as you age is the fear of aging. Let us not forget, aging is a privilege. Not everybody gets to do it. So we used to buy into the fact, when I say we, I mean women, we used to buy into the story that our power was all here. Well, we know better now, don't we? Our power and our beauty is here. And we gain more of that as we age, because we've got nothing to lose. So here we've got this wisdom, and we're, we're able to be teachers, which is such a bonus for us. 
So here we are in our 70s, 80s, and 90s, and we get to bring up those that are in their 40s, 50s, and, and 60s to know not to be afraid of aging, but to actually look forward to it. It's a bonus. There's a freedom in aging that we never knew before. So here we are, aging in high heels. And aging in high heels, by the way, is, is just up here. You don't have to wear high heels. You have to walk into the room feeling like you're in high heels. <laughs> you have to be confident and feel like, I've got something to say, I've got something to hear, I want to learn from you, I'm not going to fade into the wallpaper, I still have things I want to learn and not things I want to say. Personally, I want to live chapters 2, 3, 4, and 5. I've got so much more I want to do. Irma Brombeck. Do any of you remember Irma Brombeck? Yeah, now I know how old you are. <laughs> she was a great sage, and she said, when I meet my maker, I want to say to him, I used up every inch of talent you gave me. That's what I want to say. That's how I want to feel. So life doesn't stop like it used to 30 years ago at 65 when, when you had to retire. <clears throat> life doesn't stop at all. The fact that we're living in this health span and that we know so much about our nutrition and about our, our um, goals for the future is such a bonus. Well, I used to say all this, that I would go to these homes and I would see all these energetic people, and I would see some people that were 70 that were old, and some people that were 70 that was young, that were young. And I had my own theory, but I had no scientific data to back me up. Those who were excited about life, those who were taking classes, those who were exercising and had goals, those who were social, they had that young look, that glint in their eye. Those who had no interest in learning or doing anything were old. But I didn't know what I was talking about. I just thought this. Well, a couple of months ago, the most exciting thing happened to me. I saw in the Sunday Times that a book had just come out by two young women scientists, one of them a Nobel Prize winner, and their names are um, Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn and Elisa Eppel, and it's called the telomere effect. Does anybody know about, Lois, do you know about telomeres? Does anybody know about telomeres? Well, telomeres were all born with a certain length of telomere. And as we grow older, they shrink. And you can kind of picture what, what they say in their book. You can kind of picture a shoelace that kind of starts unraveling and starts shrinking. But they did these studies, scientific studies. And those who were doing things that they loved doing, and those who were doing things uh, nutritionally well and, and um, exercising, and those who were excited about life, their telomeres were actually growing. So your cells can listen to your body, and that's the most exciting news. And that's how we're going to live longer and stronger in this health span because our telomeres are listening to us. And you can say to them, all right, do you hear me? <laughs> so the people that they, for instance, they had a study of caregivers. Well, caregivers are under tremendous stress all the time. Their telomeres were shrinking. Those who were still <coughs> running races or doing what they loved, their telomeres were growing. And those were the people with the glint in their eyes. Those were the people that were enjoying life, that were social, that were not living by themselves, watching television, staying by themselves, but they had lives that they looked forward to. They were mentoring children. They were making a contribution in the world. And so we're all able to do that as we age. This is such an exciting time to be aging. And we all have to say, I was talking to someone earlier t tonight, we all have to be proud of what age we are. Yes, I'm 83, damn it. But you know what? It's a privilege. We all have to be proud, and we have to let others know that it's a good thing. It's a good thing. 
and we have to remember that. And so I want to end with still one of my favorite quotes. I use it over and over again because nothing else says it quite like this. Emil Zola, who says, if you ask me what I came here to do, I came here to live out loud. <laughs> I came here to live out loud. I hope you did too. By the way, for any of you who haven't already bought it, I am selling my book. So I'm happy to sign it to you or to friends or to whomever. And, um, and I think Julie and I will take some questions. Do we have any questions? Yes. Telemaris, how do you spell that word? Or Telemer. Yeah, how do you say Telemaris? Know more about that. The Telemary effect is this book. You think I'd be selling my own book and not this, but this was so fascinating. This might not be my most strategic move. But it's information we should all have, and it's really important. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you all for coming, and thank you to Gohanya and So I know many people are probably getting ready to go to dinner, but the bar is still open, and you can also meet and greet and uh, talk to the speakers tonight. And thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. And, We'll be again continuing these series, and I really appreciate this. Thank you so much.